Okay. All right. Ah. Good morning, Edwin. Good to see you. Good morning, Edwin. I don't know if you can hear us. Good, good, good morning, Pastor Tim. Ah, good. I can hear you. Okay, let me pull this up. Here we go. Uh, uh, today, we just have a few, few Zoom sessions left. Really, we're almost in the month of May, which means June is just around the corner. And um, got my plane tickets. Actually, uh, one of the airlines canceled their flight. Uh, so I had to rebook it through another airline. And the cost went up like 50% really expensive right now to travel but uh i miss you guys so much that i'm going to sacrifice and pay for the higher ticket price to come <laughs> but uh the lord was gracious and he was able to provide the funds needed so really looking forward to, to being there uh, with you guys and again the dates are the 20 7th june 27th to july 2nd so i'm going to be meeting with rj next week to coordinate some of the details and getting things set up and i know they're doing construction at uh, living word there in banawa and so uh, but pastor mel said he could get us set up in the, the spot there so yeah make sure you've got that those dates on your calendar june 27th to uh july second maybe july 1st maybe we'll just uh do monday to friday i think we can we can squeeze everything in so so with that i wanted to spend these last few sessions i've got a few more sessions with you in fact why don't i just pull up this the schedule right now just to keep it in front of us uh where is it uh, this one there. I don't know if you guys can see that. Okay, here, let me do this. Pull it over here. Make it bigger. All right, let me try this again. Yeah, let me just show the schedule to you real quick. I know you guys, uh, most of you have already seen this. We went over it together last time we met a couple weeks ago, but I just wanted to remind you. So basically where we're at is uh, right now, April 29th. Uh, for the next few weeks, we'll meet until May 20. That'll be our last uh, Zoom class, at least for uh, before the Module 4 workshop. And so we're going to just keep meeting the next few weeks. And I'm just going to keep reviewing uh, the assignments that are due, just so you have a, a video, a, a recorded session to go to if you are working on the assignment and need help. So. Um, the, all the assignments or all of the sessions are, are loaded into Canvas, so you can go there and look at any uh, classes you missed, or if you're working on one of the assignments and want to see a review of that, you can go online. We will also do some of that when we gather for our workshop uh, together, and I can even help you with your assignment. So I just want to remind you of that for so the next few weeks. We'll be gathering here. Um, on Zoom, as we have been doing, and then the between now and June 27th, want you to get all of your module one, two, and three assignments done. And I've noticed some of you have been working on those, so uh, that's great. I'm really encouraged by that. Uh, some of you need to get working on those, so if you can just even between now and and the end of June, we're looking at that's what about six or seven weeks. So if you just can set aside maybe a three or four hour block of time, uh, if you can set aside a three or four hour block of time each week, I think you'll you'll make a lot of progress in getting through those assignments. So um, I just want to, to keep that in front of you, keep you aware of that and remind you of that. So June 27th, as you know, as I note here is the, let me highlight that as well when we were going to have our module four workshop in person. Okay. So that's a Monday to a Saturday. And like I said, I might be able to get us done by the first Lord willing. Okay. So with that, 
And then when we are at the module four workshop, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, future dates and all of that, of that discussion. But, uh, but for now, just focus on your module one, two, and three assignments. And that's includes any, any of you that need to still preach your narrative sermons, all right? Uh, you can do that, uh, preach those narrative sermons, or, or sorry, the poetry sermons. Uh, and some of you actually, it's okay if you want to preach your narrative sermon as well during that workshop. Uh, some of you still have a narrative sermon or two to complete. So, um, so that way, if we, we can get everything in the next six or seven weeks, we can get all those module one, two, and three assignments done. Then we can uh, focus our attention on module four. All right. So what I want to do with you guys this morning is just, again, kind of cover one more of the assignments and just go through it with you. Make sure you don't have any questions on that. And of course, we've seen this over and over again, this exegetical process with the uh, every step is essentially the same for each genre, except step number four is the one that is different depending on the genre. Uh, for the epistles, we don't have a step four. We go directly from the studying the literary context of the book, and we, we don't have a step four, uh, a separate step four. We go straight to the block diagram, the structural diagram of the passage. But when we do narratives, we have a fourth, an additional step. We call it narrative analysis. And then for poetry, that step four was a poetic analysis of the passage. And for prophecy, we also have this step four, which is uh, the prophetic analysis of the passage. And that's something I reviewed with you last week, just in brief. But essentially, as we've seen with the other genres, all the other steps after that are essentially the same. Some slight differences, but essentially the same thing. All right. So uh, as I mentioned to you last week, I just wanted to put this before you again. Um, the first step to read and observe the book, we discussed that in session 4.7, and I went through the assignment with you, um, or at least a, a, an example of the assignment with you, so you could have an idea of the expectation. This is posted on Canvas, so you have the formatted assignment there, and there should be all the information you need. Uh, the second step, the background context of the book. Uh, we reviewed that in sessions 4.8 and 4.9, and also went over the assignment 4.7 for you, uh, giving you an example to show you what to do for that. The third step, the literary context of the book. Again, these first three steps focus on the book, and really, I think I just asked you to, to for, uh, for the, yeah, I asked you that it was for the book, the book of Zechariah, because that's the passage you're going to have. And then the next passage, the book of Revelation, will be, you'll be doing it for that book. But for these first assignments, they're focused on the Old Testament passage you've been given in Zechariah. So the first three steps, read and observe, background context, literary context, those are of the book. Okay? So... That was assignments 4.6, 7, and 8. And for the literary context, we covered that in session 4.10. So you can go back to Canvas and log in and go to, as I've shown you um, before, let me just do that again real quick because I think it's important to keep that in front of us. Um, so if you go to here, let me do it this way. All right, hopefully you can see this is the TMAI dot instructure.com. And you, you should see a preaching for there. And then of course this big, I put it in nice big font for you, the link to download all course files. That's the key link. If you get to this, you know, if you log in and you're not sure what to do, just go to this link to download all course files. And you'll, again, find everything, all the resources here, all the handouts, from the class notes, the assignments are here. And also, here, let me do this. We 
this will make it a little easier to see. Uh, there we go. Okay, so all the assignments. So as I, I just mentioned, uh, assignment or session 4.10, was a contextual flow. So let's say you're you're working on that assignment, um, assignment 4.8, and you you want to take a look at. So you download the. Uh, you can even do this on Canvas. You download the assignment if you want. Okay, and it, you see it here, right? That gives all the information for the assignment. And then what you can do is I've got the video right there. All right, you can pull that up if you need to. I have the class notes here. Whoops, oh, what happened to the class notes? All right, I gotta put the class notes there for you. Um, and then you can, here's the video for it. Ah, look at these guys' beautiful faces. All right, so, all right, so all the stuff is there. If, if you've forgotten some things or wanted to do a quick review, you can do that, all right? So again, that's just on the, the Canvas and then when you finish the assignment, of course, you uh, can upload it there, okay? So with, with that, any questions on that? I don't wanna assume every, I know you guys have shown this several times, but over the course of the last year or so, but uh, anybody have questions on that? That location is a great resource for all the information you're gonna need for the assignments. All right, so uh, that's assignment 4.10 was for step three. Uh, then last week, as I mentioned, uh, the prophetic analysis uh, of the passage, uh, we covered that in sessions 4.11 to 4.14. By the way, the four here just means module four, and then the second number is the session. So 4.11 is session four, a uh, session 11, module four. So uh, we covered in those four sessions what to do for the prophetic analysis, and that is assignment 4.10, prophetic analysis of the Zechariah passage, all right? And that's where we left off last week before I launched into sort of an update on the schedule and, and all that information that we covered for the class. So what I want to do this week is start uh, probably this week and next We'll focus our attention on the next three steps, which all are part of the next assignment that is due for the Zechariah, Pat, your assigned Zechariah passage. And that is assignment 4.12, which includes the diagram of your passage, the textual observations, and the word studies. Okay. So, with that, I wanted to take a few minutes. It's been several months. Since we've talked about diagramming, I know it's, I'm sure, certain it's Jesse's favorite topic, but I know it's you, most of you guys. This is the favorite thing that you love about Tatea is the diagramming. So I know you really are excited every time that I uh, want to go over this with you. So I want to, like Pastor Ermon said a few minutes ago, he's very excited. And he said that because he knew we were going to talk about diagramming today. So. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to uh, spend a little time, do a review of it, and then we'll look at an example from uh, Obadiah, a uh, prophetic book, just a diagram there, and then uh, that'll give you, you know, again, some insight in regards to what will be required of you for your Zechariah passage. Now, for those of you who've been given Zechariah passage, in that uh, passage, I'm only going to ask you to diagram like four verses from the text. You don't have, some of you have a whole chapter, which is 10 or 12 verses. So I'll, I'll uh, only be asking you to, to, you don't have to do the whole chapter unless you want to, to do that. Okay. But with that, let's take a look, remind ourselves of, um, it's called either, I think we originally called it structural diagramming. Um, I like to call it block diagramming. Some people just call it textual diagramming or just diagramming, all right? You'll hear all those terms. Usually diagramming, some people call it phrasing. I think uh, Bible arc 
refers to this as phrasing. So you'll hear all of those different terms, but uh, basically to diagram the passage, again, if you remember, um, diagramming is the most effective tool we have for studying epistles because epistles are instructional, they're logical, there's a, 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 a again, a, a formal structure to it, it's didactic, it's, so because of that, um, epistles are structured in a logical way where each phrase and clause is interconnected, is connected to another phrase or clause in the sentence. And so diagramming is very effective in epistles. And it also can be helpful for poetic passages, as we looked at in module three, because again, poetic text, even though it's figurative language, even though there's imagery there, it's still instructional. Uh, it's still providing instruction to, to the reader. Uh, we mentioned with narratives, though, narratives are a little different. You normally won't diagram very much in narrative passages unless there's an instructional part in it. Like if it's, you're in the Gospels and it's one of Jesus' sermons. Or, uh, or, you know, in the Gospels, Jesus often gives instructional statements. So those would be things that you would diagram. But just... In narratives, you don't have to diagram, you know, all the narrative. You know, he said this and she said that. They did this. Um, those aren't necessary or, or helpful. So, in uh, but for prophetic text, diagramming is also a very useful tool because much of the prophetic genre is sermons, right? You go back to near the beginning when we talked about the prophetic books. Uh, basically, the prophetic book is set up as a series of sermons that the prophet has collected for to present an overall message to the reader. Now, in the prophetic books, there's also some narrative parts to them that you have to keep in, uh, take into account. But much of the prophetic books are really sermons. And because sermons are instructional, right? We have exhortation. We have instruction then uh, diagramming uh, will, will be used quite a bit when we're doing prophetic books as well. Even though, again, they're often in the form of poetry, uh, still it's, it's, it's instructional in nature, okay? And so if you'll remember, <coughs> excuse me, uh, if we think of an epistle, uh, you know, or really we could, we could say, uh, or a, a sermon, like in a, in a prophetic book, will be broken up into paragraphs, right? As you read through the prophetic passages that are, are, are sermons, they're going to be uh, paragraph driven, like an epistle, because it's somebody who's preaching and he will have a series of points that he's making, and each point will be represented in a paragraph. OK, and each of those paragraphs uh, we could break down into sentences, right? Most paragraphs usually have more than one sentence, unless you're the Apostle Paul who likes to write just one long sentence to make up a lot of his paragraphs. But normally, um, you know, each epistle or each sermon within a prophetic text will be um, have more uh, have several paragraphs usually, and in each paragraph, those will usually be made up of at least one sentence, typically more than one sentence. And then each sentence, we can even break it down further into those uh, things we call clauses and phrases. And basically, a clause and a phrase is just a group of words that go together, all right? A clause is a group of words which contain both a subject and a verb. All right, so I could say phrases and clauses are um, basically a group of words that go together. Now, how do they go together and what do they contain? Well, a clause contains a subject and a verb in that group of words. Right? So he um made a basket right it's the nba playoffs so we'll talk about basketball that's a clause 
All right, contains a subject, he, and a verb, made. Or you could say shot, basket. Now, a phrase does not contain both a subject and a verb. So he shot a basket. Let's say that's the clause. A verb might be um, in, in the game. All right, in the game is a phrase. That is, it's a group of words that belong, that go together. They present an idea. But in this case, they don't have a subject and a verb. All right, so that's the... Basic difference. Now, in a, in a sentence, a sentence will be made up of, typically made up of at least one clause and at least usually one phrase. It doesn't have to have a phrase, but they often do. Sentences usually have even more than one phrase and sometimes more than one clause. All right. And then here was the process that we went through when we uh, did diagramming. Essentially, we broke it down into four steps. Now, I think when I originally taught this to you guys way, way, way back, if you guys can remember long ago, in module one, when we all gathered together, right, in that room, we were all squeezed in there. Um, and we that's when we first introduced diagramming. And back in those days, I think... Um, uh, I've modified a few things since that that time, and I think we covered this last year when we reviewed it together. Uh, but basically, the process for constructing a diagram, if we can see this here, is, can you guys see on your screens the uh, diagramming process? Can everybody see that? Okay, good. My computer's acting funny here. I just wanted to make sure. Um, Let's move that over here. Okay, good. There we go. So the first step is to identify, let's see if I have it here, the um, independent clauses in the sentence. And if you'll remember, there the clause, again, what is a clause? A group of words that go together and contain a subject and a verb. Now, there are two kinds of clauses, if you'll remember. One is the independent clause. That is, it can stand alone. So that sentence I gave you before, he made a, or he, he made a basket, that can stand alone. That's a complete thought. It's a clause. It has a subject, he, a verb made, and an object, basket, and it presents a complete thought. Now, we could have a situation like a clause, um, uh, who made a basket, all right? Now, this is a dependent clause because it's introduced by this word who. It, it doesn't give us, well, who is the who? And the, the word who there indicates there's someone else in the sentence this is referring to. And so in this case, it would, it would not stand alone. So you could talk about um, Jesse, who made a basket, won the game. OK, so now this is a dependent clause. It's dependent on something else in the sentence. In this case, it's dependent on Jesse because it's connected to Jesse. Uh, he is the who. All right. But if we had just put Jesse made a basket, that's a complete thought. Stands alone. This one does not. OK, and the way you figure it out, if it's independent or dependent, is look for is there a, a word in front of it that introduces the clause? And does the, that word indicate that it must go somewhere else in the sentence? All right, we'll look at a couple more examples. So a dependent clause modifies another word in the sentence. It cannot stand alone, right? In this case, who made a basket modifies Jesse, all right? And in the diagram, we would put it like this, right? We would put Jesse, who made the game, who who made a basket, won the game. All right, we put that under Jesse. So we have the independent, dependent clause. So what we want to try to do, if we can, is in the first step, and if you look at your passage, see if you can identify the independent clause or clauses in that passage. 
Okay. And sometimes it's hard to see them all. So at least find the first one. Normally it's given near the beginning of the passage. Not always, but normally. All right. So try to find that independent clause. And then the second step is to identify the remaining phrases and clauses in the sentence. And we do that by looking for those connector words. And I'll show you that in a minute. All right. That's the second step is first try to identify uh, at least one of the independent clauses and then go through the whole passage and see if you can identify each of the phrases and clauses that are there. And then the third step is to say, OK, how does how do each phrase and clause function in the sentence? That is essentially what uh, other word in the sentence do they modify? OK, that's the question we're trying to answer. And step three is the hardest step in the whole process. OK, because you're trying to understand, OK, how does this phrase or clause fit? So, for example, in uh, Jesse, who made a basket, won the game. Jesse's the subject. And the line here, one is the verb. OK. And then the game, that is the object. All right, that's receiving the action. Now, who made a basket? That is the dependent clause in the sentence. And we have to ask, well, what is it modifying? That is, what word is it connected to? What word is it modifying? In this case, it's modifying Jesse. It's telling us uh, something about Jesse, who, and the key word is who there, who made a basket. So that's telling us it is Jesse who made the basket. All right. So that's what the third step we're trying to do is once we've identified all the phrases and clauses, now we ask, okay, what word does this particular phrase or clause connect to? What does it modify? All right? And if it's independent, it doesn't modify anything else. It stands alone. So the independent clause is by itself. Other phrases and clauses will that are dependent will modify something in the independent clause, but you never have an independent clause modifying something else, okay? That's why in the diagram, they go all the way to the left on your um, diagram or left. I don't know which way it looks on your screen, but so we, we identify, if we can, the independent clause, then we identify the remaining phrases and clauses. Then the, the hard work comes in trying to identify how each of those phrases and clauses function in the sentence. And then finally, we construct a diagram where we move the phrase or that clause under the word that it modifies. Okay? So let me just take a simple example that we've looked at before. But again, I just, the purpose this morning is to, to review this stuff especially if you haven't done it in a little while. So we'll look at a passage we've looked at before. I'm going to ask Eric, Pastor Eric, if you could just uh, read this. We're going to do Psalm 117. It's only two, two verses. It's the preacher's favorite chapter in the whole Bible. Right here. Yes, Pastor Tim. Verse 1. Praise the Lord, all nations. Loud him, all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Praise the Lord. All right. It's a great little psalm. But also, it's really nice uh, for us because we can sort of see how this diagramming works in a, in a simple way. Now, as we look at this particular passage, we first the first step we're going to diagram this is to identify the independent clause or clauses in the sentence. Now, here we have actually a few independent clauses. That is, Statements, clauses that stand alone. Give a complete thought. Um, Eric, since you read this one, can you identify at least one of those independent clauses here for us? Praise the Lord. Yes. Praise the Lord. And we could even add to that all nations since that's the subject. But yeah, you praise the Lord. Okay, good. Now, it turns out we also have a couple of other we have another praise the Lord at the end of this uh, passage. And then laud him all peoples. That's another 
clause that actually stands by itself. It's make, giving a complete thought. And this is the case often in the Psalms. You'll see several independent clauses given within, but they all relate to each other if it's in the same stanza. Notice these three are all similar. In fact, the first and third are exactly the same. Praise the Lord. And then the second one, very similar. Laud him. Now, the verse two, those two um, uh, uh, those two lines in, in verse two are not independent clauses. How do we know that? Well, that takes us to the second step. Notice they begin with these, what we call oh. connector words, all right? Or. Yeah, exactly. That's one of them. So uh, if you remember way back, yeah, Jesse, did you have a comment? Uh, it signifies reason, so they made a conjunction. Yes, exactly. And so let's just quickly remind ourselves of what are these connector words? Um, phrases and clauses can be identified by a word that introduces it, usually, not always, but usually. Okay, so normally you'll have in a, in a passage, you'll have an independent clause, and then you'll have a dependent clause, perhaps a phrase, maybe another phrase, maybe another dependent clause, another phrase. Well, each of those are introduced by a connector word. That's what I call it. I don't think you'll see that in any English grammar, okay? <laughs> but, but I think for the purposes of diagramming, it's, it's important to understand that's how the English language typically functions, is that it will have all of these thoughts, you know, small thoughts, big thoughts, main thoughts, supporting thoughts, you know, all of these thoughts uh, grouped together in words. And those word groupings are either a phrase or a clause. And if it's a phrase or a dependent clause, it's going to be introduced by a connector word. Now, connector words introduce a phrase or clause, and then they also tell us where the previous phrase or clause ends. Because you won't, you do not have, uh, state, say, let me say this another way, you will not have two connector words in the same phrase or clause okay only one per customer all right there's no buy one get one here uh, it is one connector word for each phrase or clause because they introduce that phrase or clause and then when you get to the next connector word then you know okay that phrase or clause ends because i see another connector word that's introducing the next one. All right, so just keep keep that in mind. Connector words connect, but they also tell you where uh, where they divide as well. So uh, there are different kinds of connector words. Uh, Jesse just mentioned one of them. We've talked about these quite often, actually. Oh, I wanted to, yeah. Um, there are conjunctions, prepositions, relative pronouns. Remember, I, I can see you guys are just getting so excited as you're thinking about these things again and remembering the wonderful times that you have had uh, with these particular grammatical expressions. But we have conjunctions, prepositions, relative pronouns, participles, and then punctuation, which is not a connector word but also can be helpful in showing us phrases or uh, clauses in English. But as far as connector words, that's these four. And what I gave you before is um, really a list of a few connector words that if you can memorize them, will really, really, really help you in, in seeing them within a passage, all right? Because there's, there are literally there's hundreds of connector words. I think just prepositions alone, there's like uh, I read somewhere it's like 150 prepositions in the English language. Now, who's going to memorize 150 word uh, preposition? That's that's not really doable. Um, so what I tried to do for you guys was essentially break this down. Okay, I can do it this way. to 
just giving you a few words to memorize. Um, I think in total, there's like 25. If you count all of these words, there's about 25 of them. If you can memorize those, uh, that will really help you be more effective and, and much quicker in this process. Because if you can see these connector words, then right away you say, ah, there's where a phrase or clause begins. And then you just look, okay, this is the phrase or the clause. Ah, there's a subject and a verb, it's a clause. Oh, there's no verb, it's a phrase. But the connector word at least tells you uh, where those phrases and clauses are, all right? And so if you memorize these 25 connector words, you'll capture, I would say, at least 90%. You'll see at least 90% of the connector words in the biblical text, all right? You won't, you won't see all of them, but you'll see most of them, okay? And so... Um, and then I just use an acronym. I don't know if it helps or not. Some people it helps, but so and boy, remember, was our coordinating conjunctions. Remember, coordinating conjunctions connect two uh, words or phrases or clauses of equal grammatical importance. Um, that's coordinating. And then for subordinating, that connects a dependent clause to another word in the sentence. And I told you, just try to memorize, you know, F swab it. And that is these particular, because these are the, the most common subordinating conjunctions. Not all of them. There's a, there's a long list of subordinating conjunctions, but this is, you'll, this is, covers most of them. <laughs> then for prepositions, I, I encourage you to memorize this acronym, a whiff boot. Okay, which is these nine prepositions, which are used about, you know, over 80, 90 percent of the time. Okay. And then for the relative pronouns, you only have three. Praise God. There's just three of those to memorize. I can do that. Uh, so who, which, and that. Now, there's other ones, right? Whoever, uh, whichever. Um, whom, right? But essentially, if you see the word who or which or sometimes that, that's the tricky one. This guy is a little bit difficult because notice that is also up here. It can be a coordinating conjunction as well. So that gives us some trouble. But um, the other words, who and which, are really straightforward. So again, just memorize and nor, but, or yet, and then F swab it. And then a with boot at, within, for, from, by, on, of, to, and who, which, and that. And you'll capture a number of the connector words. And now participles, those were the tricky guys, but the ones we loved, which was a verb plus ing. But, um, the way we determine how to, to identify those was make sure there's no subject. So sometimes you'll have this, right? Let's say we have a sentence of, I, I ran to the, or I, I went to the store running quickly. Okay, now here, Running is participle, but you have to be careful because sometimes we will have, I was running quickly to the store. Now, in this case, same word running, but it's not a participle because notice it is the subject, it is, there's a subject to it, I. Here, the word I is the subject of the verb went. All right, but in the second sentence, I is the subject of was running. Okay, so what running here is not a participle. Notice also there's a verb of being in front of it. I was, well, I was what? I was running. So was running is the verbal idea. So in this case, it is not a participle. Or if you had the running man was me. Here again, we see running, but in this case, notice there's an article in front of it. 
the. So that tells us running is not a verb here because it's the running man. So the always introduces a noun. So in this case, running is not a participle. It's a noun. In this case, running is the verb. But in this, the first sentence, running is a participle. There's no subject. There's no verb of being. There's no article. So it stands alone. So we would identify it as a participle. Why does that matter? Well, because then a participle is a connector word. It will introduce a phrase that's modifying something else. In this case, it's modifying when, right? It's answering the question how I went running. That's how I went to the store. But in the second sentence, was running is my verb. All right, so you don't go I was running. Running doesn't modify was. Was running goes together. And here, you don't have running modifying anything. It's the running man. So actually, uh, running is not a participle here. It's, it's really describing the man. Okay? And if you remember, those of you that have really good memories, that was called a gerund. When you have a verb plus ing, which functions as a noun, that's called a gerund, all right? But if you re remember that or not, just look for it. If you see a subject for, or if it said it was a running man, you know, again, A is an article. So articles always introduce nouns. And here are the nouns run. Okay. Uh, the running, no, I should word it this way. The running was too hard for me. That's a better expression. Not running man. It's not a good example. Okay. All right. So hopefully this is review, but uh, are there any questions about these connector words? Yeah, I know you're going, oh, oh I'm having nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Okay, so why are we looking at connector words? Because again, remember, those are the keys to identifying the phrases and clauses in the sentence because they introduce phrases and clauses. Now, there's a little bit of a trick as we talked about with poetry. In poetry, the poet often leaves out connector words, but the it's assumed that they're there. Remember we called that ellipsis? Well, sometimes you'll have, and we even see it in this Psalm a little bit, where, for example, notice we have praise the Lord all nations, laud him all peoples. There's no connector word. We should expect something like and, right? But he doesn't put it in there. It's assumed. Okay, this, these aren't two separate paragraphs, right? It's, it's not praise the Lord, all nations. Okay, that's one paragraph, one stanza. And then lot of all peoples. Well, no, this is part of verse one and two are one stanza. They all go together. But here, the psalmist, the poet chose not to put in the word and, but, but we still understand these two independent clauses are linked together. Um, but he didn't put a connector word for that. So sometimes in poems, we have to really understand what the poet is saying because there may be times he doesn't include connector words that, that are, are there. And if you go back into uh, the workshop sessions last year, when we talked about the diagramming, we went through an example from, I think, Psalm... Was it 99? I don't remember. And there were some examples of that. Okay, so identify the independent clauses. Second step, identify the other phrases and clauses by looking for the connector words. 
And again, these are the more common, the most common ones, not all of them. And then, so let's do that uh, for this psalm. You guys have already, somebody I heard mention one already. These are the connector words in Psalm 117. For, that's connector word toward, and, and then of, okay? Now you might say, wait a minute, there's an I-N-G word here, but uh, everlasting is a noun, okay? It's not a verb. So English is tricky. You know, it's like uh, understanding. Okay, that's that can be a verb, but also it can be a noun, right? His understanding was uh, great, okay? Here it's a noun, but sometimes it can be a verb. I, I was uh, not understanding my teacher. Here, <laughs> this is, is functioning as a noun. A verb, sorry. All right, so some English words are tricky. And I'm sorry about that. I apologize for my language, but every language has its own problems, okay? This is one for English, <laughs> these ing words. Um, but you can sort of figure it out if you think about the truth, if you understand what the sentence or the phrase or clause is. Here we have, and the truth. Now, that can't stand by itself. The truth is everlasting is what goes together. So that's actually is everlasting is part of the clause with the subject, the truth. Okay, but here, just want to show you. So we see some connector words here, for, toward, and and of. Now, for and and of are part of the list I said you should memorize. Toward is one that's not as commonly used, so it wasn't in the preposition list but still if you memorize that list we would have caught three of the four here okay and normally it's more like 90 percent or 85 percent that you'll catch so in this particular psalm these are the connector words and so what we do then is is take uh, and we separate this is the next step. We separate each independent clause and each phrasing clause, all right? So we know praise the Lord all nations. That was an independent clause. Laud him all peoples. That was an independent clause. For his loving kindness is great, all right? This is a separated, whoops. And notice I separated at the next connector word, toward. And then I separate it. Now, there's one little trick here that you may not see, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But basically, once you identify all the connector words, then you separate all the phrases and clauses. All right? You'll have independent clauses, and then you'll have dependent clauses, and you'll have phrases. And the phrases and dependent clauses are introduced by a connector word. Okay? Now, then we what we want to do is just identify each of the phrases and clauses. So I'm just going to do that real quick with you guys. Um, all right, we I already identified Eric indicated. This is an independent clause. This is an independent clause. All right, uh, John, tell me what is this one for his everlasting for his loving kindness is great. Is this a phrase or a clause? It's a clause uh, yes. a certain because it has a subject and the verb. Correct. His is the subject. Uh, sorry, loving kindness is the subject. Kindness. And what is the verb? Is. It's a yeah. linking verb. Here, I'm just going to highlight. So loving kindness is my noun and my verb is is, is in this case. Okay. And then great, if you'll remember, is what we call the subject complement. Uh, that's another discussion. All right, good. 
that's a clause. All right, John, why don't you do the next one? Toward us. Is that a phrase or a clause? That one is a phrase. A preposition Correct. Of phrase. There's no verb, no subject. All right, good. Um, now, this one, John, I'll have you just finish it out. It's a short verse. This one's a little tricky. Um, and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. What do I, what do, I do with this? Mm, it's, it's basically when, I think it's also a clause, Pastor Tim. Okay. But what the, like with that version maybe, because the truth is the subject. Correct. Truth is the subject here. And where's and then, where's the rest of the clause? And then in the next line. Yes. Is, is everlasting. That is the the verb. Um, uh, and what we call the subject complement. I'll just say the subject complement of the clause. Can I just say uh So notice here, we have a phrase of the Lord that actually is inserted in the middle of a clause. And this happens a lot in English and in Greek, actually, um, because often the author wants to be very clear about what word that the phrase is modifying. And so often we'll see in English and also in Greek, that phrase come right after the word it modifies, even if it has to split up a clause to do it, right? So like I did before, I said, Jesse, who made the basket, won the game. Well, I did the same exact thing. I inserted a clause in this case in between the independent clause. All right, you guys notice that? So really, the independent clause is Jesse won the game. But I stuck this dependent clause in the middle of it so that I, it was obvious and clear what it's modifying. Because you wouldn't have it this way. Jesse won the game who made the basket. In English, that wouldn't make sense. It's like, well, what, is, what are we referring to? The game is not a who. This would be an awkward construction. So normally in English, you just say, you put the dependent phrase or clause often could go right after the word it modifies, all right? Um, or you could say, Jesse won. And some people might put in amazing fashion, the game, all right? Same thing happens here, subject and verb is Jesse one and the game is the object, but here I've inserted this phrase in this case in between them because I want to emphasize how he won. All right, now you won't see this all the time. Sometimes the person may put Jesse won the game in amazing fashion. That conveys a similar idea, but in English, uh, oftentimes phrases, dependent phrases and clauses get moved around. So just keep that in mind. We see that a lot uh, in, in biblical texts. Now, how would you know that? Well, you'd have to say, because if you kept the sentence, if you let's say we just kept it like this, okay? We say, oh, of is a connector word. And I know that Praise the Lord is an independent clause. Okay, so I know that of the Lord is everlasting. I put that in one line because of is my connector word. Praise starts the next clause. But then you go back and say, okay, of the Lord is everlasting. Does that even make sense? Because it doesn't say just the Lord is everlasting. It says of the Lord is ever. So that should stick out as that, that doesn't make sense. So I have is everlasting. Where does that go? The Lord is not the subject of that. Ah, truth is. So this must be 
the case where a phrase is inserted in between inside of a clause. Okay. Questions on that? Like I said, you'll you'll see this fairly regularly in in scripture where these phrases or dependent clauses sort of get inserted inside of the sentence. Okay. All right. Well, then let's go to the third the third uh, step here. So we've got these particular. We've we've split it up. We've uh, uh, identified all the phrases and clauses in the sentence. And now what we want to do is, okay, so how do these phrases and clauses function in the sentence? And remember, independent clauses do not modify something else in the sentence. So the independent clauses will stand by themselves. Okay. And again, um, as we think about how these phrases and clauses modify, Remember, hopefully you remember back in the old days when we talked about these this diagramming, we had two kinds of phrases and clauses. We had those phrases or clauses that modified a verb. And we had those phrases and clauses that modified a noun. Okay, and the ones that modify a verb, they answered the question of when, where, why, or how. Those that modified a noun answered questions like which one, what kind, who, uh, uh, giving a description. All right, that's why we call the ones modifying a verb were adverbial, the ones modifying a noun were adjectival or active like adjectives. So as we look at this passage, we remember, okay, I've got three independent clauses here. Praise the Lord, laud him all peoples, and praise the Lord. So I know, okay, those don't, I don't touch. They're independent. They stand by themselves. But now in verse two, I've got these other phrases and clauses. How do they work? Phrases, again, phrases always modify. Okay, they never stand alone. How do I know that? Because a phrase doesn't have a verb and a subject. And to stand alone, you have to have a clause that has a verb and a subject. So a phrase is never standalone. They will always modify. All right. And we have those dependent clauses modify. Always modify. Okay. But independent clauses never modify. Okay. Independent clause stands alone. Dependent clause is a group of words that has a verb and a subject, but it doesn't stand alone. It depends on something else in the sentence. Phrases always depend. There's no dependent phrase or independent phrase. Phrases are just phrases. They don't have a subject and verb. Therefore, they don't present a complete thought. They are always dependent on something else in the sentence. All right, so keep those in mind. So as we look at this particular, and we remember that, and the truth is everlasting, goes together, okay? Um, maybe I'll highlight it in another color, just to remind us of that. Of the Lord was inserted between them. Now, we, uh, John identified for his loving kindness is great as a clause, but we didn't ask ourselves, is this clause dependent or independent? Uh, Ruel, or what do you think? <coughs> Are you there? Sir? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about this clause? Is it dependent or independent? Can I think it, it is dependent. Okay, and how do you know that? Because 
uh, I think for the next for the next phrase. Okay. Notice is there is there a word that that be, that is in front of this clause? Four. Yeah. Remember, yeah. four is a connector word here. And so usually a connector word, it introduces something that's dependent. In this case, it's a clause it's introducing. This is actually a dependent clause. You are correct. And we know that because of the word for. For tells us reason. It's giving us uh, a reason for something. And here the reason is it modifies praise and laud telling why why should we praise the lord why should we laud him for or because his loving kindness is great okay so this word for is a very important word it's not only a connector word but it's a connector word that's to get, uh, that its meaning in this case is uh it gives a reason answers the question why why should we praise? Why should we laud? For or because his loving kindness is great. Okay? Now, as we look at this next phrase, toward us, I'm going to ask uh, uh, Edwin, in this case, toward us, Edwin, what do I do with that? What I know it's a, it modifies something because it's a phrase. Phrases always modify. So. What do you think this phrase toward us is modifying? Uh, toward. Again, Pastor Tim. This phrase toward us here, it's modifying another word in the sentence. Oh, I'm just asking what word do you think it's modifying? And usually you want to look at Words that are loving kindness. Okay. Is loving kindness toward us? Or in this case, even uh, it's where his loving kindness is directed, right? So toward us. It's it's answering the question uh where. Okay. And if we go back to remember, these two lists are very important for us to. To keep in mind, if a phrase or clause answers a question, when, where, why, or how, it's going to modify a verb. It's going to tell us something about a verb. In this case, it modifies is, actually, because it's telling us where. Where is his loving kindness great? Toward us, the direction in this case. All right. So that's a little bit tricky. Uh, here, so um, it, it's not telling us something about his loving kindness, all right? Uh, the word great is telling us something about his loving kindness. Toward us is indicating in what direction is that loving kindness direct, uh, move, uh, directed to, toward us. So it's telling us where. And since it's answering a question where, it's going to modify a verb. It's going to be adverbial. Okay, so this is like I said, this is the hardest step in the whole process because you're trying to figure out how these things are going to go. Now, and the truth is everlasting. That's my next clause here. Again, as John indicated correctly earlier, we have a phrase splitting it. We'll deal with that in a minute. But and the truth is everlasting. Notice we have that conjunction and. Remember, um, it's coordinating, and coordinating conjunctions connect equal grammatical terms. So in this case, and is connecting the truth is everlasting with his loving kindness is great. Okay, so this is a second independent clause that modifies praise and laud telling why it's giving us 
another reason to praise. Because that word and is connecting. Um, let's see, how can I show this more clearly? Let me get the passage again. All right. Okay. Praise the Lord, all nations. Lot of all peoples. For his loving kindness is great toward us. And the truth of the Lord is everlasting. So he's giving to this word and is going to connect. Uh, notice. It's going to connect this clause. The truth is everlasting. That's a clause, right? So then it has to connect to another clause because it's coordinating. It connects two things that are equal. Now, the other clause is his loving kindness is great. It's connecting to connecting those two dependent clauses together. Okay, it's not saying laud him all peoples and the truth of the Lord is everlasting. No, it's for his loving kindness is great and the truth is everlasting. Truth of the Lord. So with that, we would say that's why I said it modifies praise and laud because it goes with, it connects to the other dependent clause that modifies praise and laud. Now of the Lord, as we said, that modifies truth because it's telling us which truth or what kind. The truth of the Lord. That truth. Okay. Is everlasting is the rest of the dependent clause. Okay. So that's what we have here. And for the third step, all right? And again, this will take you the most time, but if you can figure out, make sure you see each phrase and clause, and then you just have to ask yourself these questions. If it's a clause, is it dependent? Well, if it's introduced by a connector word, it probably is. It, it, it will be. If it's a phrase, it's always modifying. So I know a phrase is modifying something else. So I just have to ask, what does it modify? Well, I think about, well, what question does it answer? And toward us, that's a direction. That's a where. So I go, okay, then it has to modify an action. It's telling us where an action happens or where it is directed. Now, of the Lord is... Um, when you have the preposition of, it always goes to the word right before it. In this case, truth. So it's just telling us what kind of truth. It's describing the truth. The Lord's truth. The truth of the Lord. So I know that's where that goes. Okay? So, that's the third step. The fourth step, then, is to take... Uh, these phrases and clauses, and now, now that I've identified where they go, then I just put it in the diagram to, to show that. So, praise the Lord, all nations, that was independent clause, so that's going to go on the left. Laud him all peoples goes on the left. Now, for his loving kindness is great. I said that, that modifies praise and laud, so I'm going to put it under praise and laud. I'm indenting it there. And I'll just do it this way. For his loving kindness is great. All right, that's answering the question why. Why praise? Why laud? Because for his loving kindness is great. Where is it great? Toward us. So I'm going to put that right under is because this is telling where. So it's indicating a direction. So that's going to modify a verb. All right. Question, Jesse? No, that's okay. Okay. No problem. All right. So his loving kindness is great toward us. 
And then we have that and, and remember I said it's going to connect, it's coordinating conjunction, connects two equal, grammatic, grammatically equal uh, phrases or clauses. And in this case, it's connecting to his loving kindness is great and the truth of the Lord. Now notice we have this split clause here. So what I do with that is I just follow, I still follow the order of uh, the passage and then what i do is i put this here and then i i throw in a uh, a line and that tells me that this goes together the truth and is everlasting goes together and they are both i'll highlight in blue dependent clauses that modify that both answer the question why. Why praise, why laud, two reasons. For one, his loving kindness is great. And two, the truth is everlasting, the Lord's truth. Now, having this diagram then, the power of, if you're able to do this process and, and understand how hmm. these phrases and clauses are linked to each other, then you can step back and you can see the structure of the passage. All right, let me just take you to, so in this case, we can see a structure here. All right, yes. we have, sorry. Chiastic structure. Is it chiastic? Yes, yes. Um, no, but it, it has an inclusio. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Remember from poetry? Yeah, an inclusio inclusive. begins and ends a stanza. In this case, it's the whole psalm because it's only two verses. And it, it bookends a stanza and it emphasizes the main theme of the stanza. Um, an, uh, a chiasm would be where uh, if these two were the same idea, if his loving kindness is great, and then the next one was, and his compassion is uh, boundless, then you might be able to make a case for some type of kind of chiastic structure. But because these are two different thoughts, two different statements. His loving kindness is great. The, tr the truth of the Lord is everlasting. Those are two distinct, separate um, reasons. Okay? So I wouldn't call this a chiasm, but I there is a, an inclusio here. So that's from a poetic sense. Now, from a grammatical sense, that's what the diagram looks at. It focuses on the gr grammar, that is how each phrase and clause connects within the, within the stanza. All right? That's not a poet poetic thing. That is a just a grammar thing, uh, how the, the language works. So from this, we can see a structure. We see a command, the two primary commands, which are independent. And then verse 2 really gives the reason for those commands. That's why I called it the mandate, the command to praise, and then the motivation or the reason to praise is in verse 2. And notice there's two reasons given. One is God's love. The second is God's word. So how I would preach this psalm would be, even though it's one stanza, I would break it up by two ideas. The first idea is the main command, which is really two commands, which are similar, praise the Lord and laud him. Now you would say, wait a minute, there's a praise the Lord at the end. Is, wouldn't that be a third point? Well, no, because of the nature of the poem, it's an inclusio. So really, um, it's praise the Lord. He's just repeating it to emphasize that's the point. But it would still, you know, with or without, you know, if that wasn't in here, um, all this is doing is just emphasizing the main idea, which is the command to praise. And then I would separate out as a second point, the reason to praise. And really it's two reasons. 
why should all nations praise the Lord? Why should all peoples pray, laud, honor God? Because of his love and because of his word. All right. Now, this structure just comes right out of understanding the diagram for, for this. And here would be another way to, if you want to have a little, a, a longer, a, an extended outline. The mandate to praise, or you could say two commands to praise. Praise him, laud him. And then the motivation to praise, or two reasons to praise. The love of God and the word of God. So that would be a little bit longer. All right. And then just that last praise the Lord would just be something that you would note as you're preaching that that's a poetic uh, device in order to bring emphasis to the major theme and the major thrust of this poem. It's a very simple poem, but actually it's a really, this is a great passage to preach. One, because it's simple, <laughs> it's short, but two, it's just a really impactful, simple, yet direct, um, uh, direct statement of the call to praise God. And then really what, you know, what should motivate us to do that? You know, and well, his, his incredible love toward us and, and the fact that he, his word, what he says is, is everlasting. It's forever. And that because of those things, he deserves our praise. So this this will preach, guys. But uh, the diagram really helps show us that structure. So instead of just going line by line, you can really understand, okay, verse 1 is the mandate to praise. Verse 2 is the motivation to praise. All right? Questions on that? Well, I was hoping <laughs> to get to the actual exercise here in Obadiah, um, but clearly we're not going to have any time to go through that. What I'm going to do is, um, let me see, what would be, yeah, so I'm going to ask you guys to, uh, next week I want to diagram at least a few of the verses here. Uh, I have 10 to 14. This will be part of the example that I put together for your assignment. But um, why don't you guys give this a try uh, this week? Just take, take you know, 30 minutes and just see, see if you can diagram this text. Just get, at least do some of it. That'll really help the discussion next week. And so next week, Lord willing, we'll, we'll go through this together and then I'll also talk a little bit about the uh, textual observations and uh, word studies but I don't want to start the diagram of this today and then we'll only get a few minutes in uh, to that so I know this is you know among the more you know diagramming is probably the most difficult step in in the exegetical process uh, but I think it yields the most fruit if we really are diligent to pursue it. Um, maybe you could see that just even from identifying the outline of that psalm that we just looked at. So that's why we keep coming back to it, or why I keep coming back to it, because I think if you take the time to, to try to learn and practice it, it's, it's really, really going to help you. And English is, you know, constructed in such a way that I think it's, and Greek, actually, that I think it, um, even though it is difficult, it is, uh, I think, a language that, that diagramming is easier to accomplish in the English language. And so then it, I think in a lot of ways you can see the structure of the text a little better. Because English is similar to Greek in a lot of ways. Um, the, the grammar is similar in a lot of ways. And even the, the like connector words, there's prepositions in Greek, there's conjunctions in Greek, there's participles in Greek, and they behave similar, pretty similar to the way they behave in English. So if you're able to do, you know, do this in the English language, 
it's really not that much further of a step to do it in Greek, you know, once you learn the Greek language, if you ever do that. But if you never get a chance to do that well, at least in English, you're, you're getting pretty close to how it would be done in, in, in the Greek text. All right. Not exactly. No two languages are exactly the same, but um, in any case, I, I think this, this is a really important tool to have in your toolbox as a as an expositor. So that's why we keep coming back to it uh, to review together. OK, one of the ways I think you can learn how to do this. Uh, and if you want, I can send this to you is is really diagram a book of the Bible, like take one of the epistles and just do a little bit, um, you know, keep going through it either each day or each week. And if you work your way through an epistle, you'll have a good understanding or a, a experience with diagram. If you want, I can send you, I did, I've done it for several epistles, but I can send you like uh, when I just finished on Colossians. And if you want to practice, and try it yourself and then take mine and compare. Mine's not perfect. Okay. There's only one inerrant book. And the text that we use is, in, is inerrant, but how I diagram it isn't. All right. But I think it's, it, it'd be a, a fairly good guide for you. So you can do it and then compare. Say, oh, okay. There's a difference here. What's the difference? Why did Pastor Tim do it this way? And maybe that would be a good learning process for you. If you're interested in doing that, just Facebook message me. I'll I'll uh, send you the my diagram for uh, for Colossians. If you want to do that, I'd be happy to. All right. But we'll at least uh, together do uh, Obadiah next week, as well as the uh, next couple of steps, just again to keep refreshed on how to do these uh, different assignments uh, together. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for your patience. <laughs> thank you for um, your endurance. Um, he who endures to the end will be saved. And so I think part of that is included in our, our diagramming uh, passage. But uh, <laughs> Amen. <don't... laughs> so. Uh... Ayaw undang will. <laughs> Um, oh, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Have you tried sentence diagramming? Yes. Uh, is it any different from, I mean, does it serve the same purpose as block, block diagramming or structural diagramming? Um, by sentence diagramming, do you mean like... Uh... You know, where you have, it's like a lot of the lines, you know, where you put um, yeah, subject, the verb, subject, subject and verb are on a line with a slash and then like a, the article, like there's a little line I below. Saw, yeah, I just saw this photo online. It, I just can send it in our group chat, but yeah. It, yeah, I can, um, like here. I just want to make sure that, that we're talking about the same thing before I answer your question. My computer's running a little slow here. Let's see. Okay, so. Yo, monkey, and I not my mga Greek. Uh, there's Greek involved. <laughs> Oops, what happened? Give me the assignment then. All right, can you see it? Yeah. Is this what you're talking about? Yes, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Yeah, this would be an example of what's called sentence or line diagram. Um, is how this is referred to. And notice in line diagramming, it too is basically... In this, you identify what word connects to what word, you know, and here it's like every word is modifying another word. So it, it goes even further down than block diagram. Block diagramming takes phrases and clauses. Line diagramming takes every word. 
So then you have, and here you have like, okay, so this line here divides a subject and a verb. So the subject here is which, the verb is are. And then this slash line divides the verb and the, in this case, it's a subject complement, the verb and the object. Uh, for example, down here, you, okay, you is the subject, and here's that line that breaks up the subject, and the verb is respect, and then there's a half line that separates the object from the verb, and then the words under the insects here, these, industrious, important, little, those all modify insects. All right, and then this dotted line is connecting this sent clause, you respect insects, with this clause, rewards can be great. So in line diagramming, it takes every word and you have to figure out, okay, what part of speech is this word? Is this a noun? Is this an adjective? Is this an adverb? Um, is this a participle? And then you have, is this an article? And then you have to figure out, okay, what word does it go to? So this is a great exercise if you want to just practice parts of speech. But it really, to me, isn't as helpful to show you how a passage is structured. Okay? Because if you compare this to, so if we were to do, uh, probably don't, I don't have the, here, let me just try it. There's a, I sent a, Sample picture in our group chat, Pastor Tim. Oh. Did uh, you? Romans. I in don't... Messenger. Oh, in Messenger. And send it here. Okay. Uh... Let me see here. Oops, that's not what I wanted. Yeah, okay. So here's uh, taking the Greek text. So therefore, and then oh man, judges everyone. So notice almost every word is uh, separated. Here And as you look at this, you don't really see the outline of the text, do you? Now, you could work your way. Some guys, the way they think, they, it helps them. But more, more, most people, this wouldn't really help you see, um, see it. Now, if I take this passage, Romans 2.1, what translation was this? I didn't catch it. I'm not ESV. ESV? Okay. So let me take Romans 2 1. All right. I'll put it here. Okay. This is how I would diagram. Therefore, you have no excuse. Use modifying man. Oh, man. Every one of you who judges for. Now, this goes back to why you have no excuse. For you condemn yourself. So this is for why uh, you have no excuse. For you condemn yourself. And then in passing judgment, this is telling us um, how you condemn yourself. And on one another is telling us where you are passing judgment. You condemn yourself. Why do you condemn yourself? Because, so this is why you condemn yourself. Um, how you condemn Pastor Tim, I think we're stuck at the messenger screen. Okay, thank you. Here, now can you see it? I'm sorry. 
<laughs> so all of that you didn't get to see. <laughs> um, but here would be how I would diagram it. So notice you see the structure. The main idea is you have no excuse. Okay, that's an independent clause. But these are all dependent phrases and clauses. Okay? So here you can see, um, sorry, this, this goes with you. So this is you, oh man, I would do that. And then four goes with have. I'm going to place it a little bit more. All right, you have no excuse. This is an independent clause. So this stands alone. This is a, Paul's main statement. And then he gives the reason you have no excuse. For you condemn yourself. And then he gives a reason that you condemn yourself. Actually, he tells them several things. He says, how you condemn yourself by passing judgment. And then why you condemn yourself because you practice the same things. So the diagram, block diagram, sort of allows you to see the structure of the passage. The line diagram, so now let's compare it. This is the line diagram. It's harder to see the structure here, isn't it? Now, certainly, once you do a line diagram, boy, you know how every word fits in the sentence, okay? That's a, that's a helpful thing. But what we're after is, what I want to see is the structure of the text, um, because you're not going to go through and explain every word in your sermon, right? So now we have, after the word therefore, we have, oh man, that's an exclamation, Directed to them. And then we have who judges. The word who modifies man. And, if, you know, you're not going to go through each and every uh, word. Now, it's helpful for you as the pastor to understand that. But I think what you're going to be trying to do more of is this. Helping them see the structure. So you're going to have one point perhaps is um, men are without excuse or you could say you know i don't know you have no excuse and the second point is why you have no excuse um or something like that but here we see the structure of the passage a little better all right so they're they're actually they're similar in that they both you know, require grammar to work through them, but they're different in that the sentence diagram or the line diagram is a lot more detailed and just focuses on how each word functions as a part of speech in the sentence. The block diagram is really looking at helping you to, to, to identify the, the structure of the passage as a whole, not just each word in the passage. That makes sense, guys. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Okay, that's a really good question. So I, I, I think sentence diagramming can be helpful to learn the language, to learn the passage really well. As far as you'd have to think about each and every word in the text, that that can help you. But um, but I think the block diagram is is sort of a good. Uh, a good mixture of understanding the grammar in the passage, but then also being able to not lose yourself in all the details and the lines and all this stuff, but actually see the picture of the text a little better. All right. But I, I know guys who sentence diagram, I, I just, for me, it, it, it's not as um, um, helpful. And then as I preach, I'm thinking more like block diagram. I'm thinking, you know, larger connections in the structure of the passage. I don't show them my block diagram when I preach, but, but then as I'm preaching, I'll be thinking, okay, so 
we first see in this psalm the, the, the mandate or the command of praise, and then the psalmist takes us to the reason for that command or the motivation to praise. And we find that in verse 2. So that's really coming out of my diagram. Um, more than anything. And in, in the reason to praise, we see actually two reasons. The first is, the second is. So we anyway, thank you for the question. Hopefully that, that helps. Thank you so much, Pastor Tim. All right, good. Any other any other questions, guys? Uh, Pastor Tim, Pastor Tim. Yeah. Uh, aside of what we are doing today about black diagramming, will you also uh, teach us again the narrative form? Because uh, my assignment passage in Sikariah chapter three, there is a storytelling there. There is a narration. Yes. So what you're going to have to do is in your passage, you have uh, Zechariah 3. Yeah. And this will be the case for most of you guys. Zechariah, yes, is basically narrative in form. And so um, you're going to look and say, are there any instructional statements here? And I would say, yes, verse 7 through 10. He's giving instruction here. Mm. How do I know that? Thus says the Lord of hosts. <laughs> All right. So I would diagram verses 7 to 10. I wouldn't diagram verses 1 to 6 because that's all describing just he showed me Joshua, the Lord said. He spoke and said, that's narrative. You're not going to diagram that. But in verse 7, he's now explaining the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. So he's going to give instruction here. And that's what verses 7 to 10 are. So I would diagram those four verses. Thank you. Okay? Thank you. Now, if you have like Zechariah 2, it's the same thing. Um, you have some dialogue. But then notice when you get to verse four, he says, thus says the Lord of hosts. And then you have sort of this instruction. So I would do like verses eight to 13 in Zechariah two. Those of you with Zechariah four, you'll have this description of the vision and the question. And then I would diagram the explanation now is in verse nine. The word of the Lord came to me saying, all right, so verses 9 and 10 would probably be what I diagram in that passage, in that um, vision. Now, for Obadiah, no, none of you have Obadiah, but if you were preaching Obadiah, studying it, the whole passage is a sermon. So I diagram the whole thing. But in the Zechariah passages, you don't have that. Zechariah, I can't remember uh, if anyone has, I think, verse 1, uh, or I think chapter 1, verses 7 to 17. I think some of you have that. Uh, here, I think the diagram would be verses 14 to 17, because that, again, is instructional. Okay? And then verse, the next vision, verse 18 to 21, uh, is the second vision. And there, again, I would be um, probably just diagram verse 21 in that case. Because the rest of this is more like narrative. Okay? So just like in narrative, you're going to have to scene. <laughs> look at it and say, okay, what parts in this passage are more like instruction or key key statements being made? That's what you're going to diagram. Okay? And if you're not sure, just ask me. Uh, just like you just did, uh, Herman. Um, and I'll let you know which, which verses I think would be helpful. But I think you can figure that out. If you, if you go through the passage, just like, okay, what here is instructional? Is it warning? Uh, judgment, you know, something that, then that's, that's the part you're going to want to diagram. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Tim. Okay. Very good question. Anybody else?
All right. 